you ready? Yeah. Are you ready for this? I'm ready for this. Let's do some good. I'd like to call the uh, July 21st uh, Reading School Committee meeting to order. Uh, we have a few things on the agenda tonight, uh, but before we get started, I'll ask if there's any public input this evening. And not so much. Great. Uh, we'll ask for reports next. Do we have a student report this evening, Andrea? Um, we don't have, there's not much going on right now. Um, just, I know there's some summer parties for students and things like that. Um, uh, school That's a great segue, Andrew. I have a question for you and then for Dr. Dory. Okay. Incoming freshmen, mm -hmm. if they are feeling apprehensive about coming into such a big building and mm -hmm. uh, finding their way around, are there opportunities during the summer for them to come in, check in at the principal's office and perhaps kind of get acclimated or do we, ever, do we ever offer anything like that, or could we? There is something being offered in August that students go to where they're connected with an upperclassman. It's called oh. Upper Connections. Uh, it's been in existence for a while now. Oh, that's I, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Sure. I didn't remember. Oh, great. I didn't remember it. I, I've talked to a few incoming freshmen, and they've sounded a little bit nervous. Yeah. So I'm glad that there is something for them to go to. Is, that, is there information on Edline for it? I don't believe that's come out yet. Okay. But um, Mr. Bakker, as you saw, sent out an email to the Reading High School community inviting any students if they want to come in and say hi to him, and I'm sure he'd be more than happy to, to talk to them. Excellent. Um, my advice, when I was a freshman, um, I had one of my friend's older sisters was at the high school, and she took me from class to class. And it made me feel so much better about my schedule. So any upcoming freshman, I definitely recommend that for them. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other reports from the committee members? Hi. I just wanted to report that I was at the high school today watching a lot of RMHS alumni be counselors at Five Star. And it was really wonderful to watch. Um, them work with the younger students in a milieu that they thrived in when they were in school um, and to watch the dynamics of some of our faculty who come back, some of our volunteers who work with Five Star. And Shrek will be this Thursday and Friday night at the Performing Arts Center. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other reports from committee members? Um, I, hope I, I hope I pronounce this correctly, but we have uh, Mrs. Ann Johnson Landry joining us this evening, our newest uh, member of the Finance Committee. Oh, so welcome, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. Whew, I knew I would remember that name, though. <laughs> well, Dr. Doherty, do you have a report this evening? I do. Great. Um, so I just want to make you aware, of, I put several documents, which I also sent to you electronically. Um, I'll just go through some of them uh, quickly. The first one is the Massachusetts version of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey results. Um, as you know, we did a presentation for you in the fall uh, of the Reading Youth Risk Behavior Survey results. The state results are always several months uh, behind. So what, what you see here is the Massachusetts results. What um, I've already reached out to Eric and McNamara and Tom Zaya. Uh, we're going to sit down and we're going to take a look to see if the trends of Reading are consistent with the trends of the state. We also have the national data that just came in as well, so we'll look to see if there are trends, national trends that are, and compare them to Reading. Um, based on that, you know, we may look at, to see if there are other things that we need to be doing to address some of the, some of the concerns that we may have. So, but I wanted to give this to you um, for your, for your review. This is um, done only every two years, though. Versus correct. We do it every year. I'm sorry? We, we do it every year. We do it every two years. Every two years. We do the YRBS every two years. So we won't be doing it. Um, no, we will be doing it this year. We'll be doing it next um, January, February. Okay. Um, the second document also focusing on uh, keeping students safe. Um, Governor Patrick came to our superintendent's conference on Thursday and spoke to the, to the superintendents, but also it was uh, the presentation of the School Safety and Security Task Force Report, um, which was uh, as part of the new law that was enacted in January. Um, 
So this, this task force has been meeting since January um, to come up with a series of recommendations on what schools should be doing to uh, keep their schools safe, not just from a physical standpoint, but also from a social emotional standpoint. So there are several recommendations in here. Um, I have reached out to uh, the police chief, the town manager, and the fire chief because they do recommend that you form that executive team to review this report. I've also given it to our district safety committee to take a look at. Um, there are, the good news is there are several things that currently are listed in here that we are doing. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, we are doing everything that we can to, to keep our schools safe with the latest research that's out there. So, um, so that, that report is for your, for your review. I know I gave you a lot of reading material. Um, the next um, report is from the Center for American Progress called the Return on Educational Investment 2014. This report was done three years ago and it's been updated. Um, and what it does is it takes a look at the amount of money that a school district is spending with the um, input, the output that a school district is getting in terms of achievement. And there are certain rankings that you can get based on um, your per pupil cost versus your uh, state achievement scores. Um, I'm pleased to report that Reading has the highest score a district can get, which is a lower cost with a, highest, with a high achievement. Um, I think it shows that the money that we are, are getting appropriated, uh, we are spending wisely and putting it to the classroom, which is the most important piece. So, um, so I gave you two documents. One was a, um, an article from Ed Week and one was the actual report. I did send you the link for Massachusetts in the email so you can compare uh, Reading to other, other school districts um, for, for your review. And then the last piece, as I mentioned um, last week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I attended the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, um, the theme this year, uh, the annual executive institute, and the theme for this year was leadership beyond compliance um, which I think was pretty fitting considering all of the things that we're going through uh, with federal and state initiatives. Um, there were several, it was a, it was a great conference. I, I do enjoy going to this conference and, and meeting with other superintendents across the state and um, listening to them and the challenges that they face versus the challenges that we face. Um, and so some, some of the things, just so you know, we had, we had two keynote speakers. One was uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin who uh, spoke mostly about her book, her latest book, The Bully Pulpit, which is a story about Teddy Roosevelt and Howard Taft. And she used that to talk about leadership lessons that uh, we could learn from particularly Teddy Roosevelt mm -hmm. um, and what we can learn from the downfalls of Howard Taft and, and how his presidency wasn't as successful as Teddy Roosevelt's. So that was a very, we heard her speak last year. She spoke about Lincoln at the time because um, the movie Lincoln had just come out. Um, so so she, it was great bringing her back. The second um, keynote speaker on the next day was um, Nicholas M Melly, who is a Harvard professor on social media. So really the focus was on communication and how in this day and age the use of social media and how you balance that um, with ways to engage the community. So it was a very, it was a really strong uh, presentation and I certainly got a lot from that which I will be using incorporating for some of the things that we want to work on with being proactive in communication. Some other key things that, um, that I, that are workshops that I attended that I want to talk about. I, I did go to a workshop that, uh, and I spoke to Mrs. Doxer about this this morning, um, on a concept called the Tenacity Challenge, which is a way to, it, it's part of an overall strategy to increase um, the ability for minority students um, to get into more higher order, higher, higher level uh, classes, honors classes, AP classes, which is, which is a gap that occurs in a lot of communities. And so the Tenacity Challenge is actually a year-long project that students 
of Latin American and African American um, origin can, can participate in, and it culminates with a day-long competition. Um, so it is something that I want to speak to uh, Mr. Bacher and Mr. Cross about to see if this is something that, that Reading would be interested in being a part of, but it sounded very exciting. There are currently 18 communities in Massachusetts that do it. Um, some are urban and some are suburban. It's the suburban communities that have MECO programs that are involved, Bedford, Weston, um, Waltham, to name, to name three. So that was one workshop. Um, I also attended a workshop on an update on NEASC. Um, and remember when I talked to you about NEASC, that you know we had suspended our process with NEASC, and several other school districts did the same thing. And NEASC, to its credit, has done uh, really taken a look at at itself and is starting to change what it does. And they will be ready to unveil a new process sometime next year, which uh, they're going to ask school districts to pilot, um, which will be much more streamlined which will focus on some key areas, but be flexible enough for school districts to focus on the areas they feel is important and at a lower cost. So um, more to come on that. Uh, as soon as I get more information, I'll be more than happy to do a presentation on that. Um, so those were a couple of the things that I uh, attended. I, I also attended several. Um, state and federal policy updates. Um, our National Association came and gave us some policy updates on education at the federal level, which right now there wasn't a lot of good news coming out of the federal government in terms of educational policy. It doesn't seem a lot to be happening. Um, the Education Secondary um, Act has not been renewed, and it, we're entering our fourth year of it not being renewed, which is, is problematic because over 46 states have waivers right now um, because the law doesn't work anymore and it needs to be renewed. Um, the IDA law needs to be renewed and it is also not being renewed right now. It's kind of stuck. Um, and so there are some other things as well that are, so there isn't a lot of positive things happening at the state level from an education policy format right now. At the federal. Right, federal? At the federal. I'm sorry, federal. So that's a very quick update of, of the conference. Oh, last thing I have is on driver's ed. Oh. Because <laughs> I know you had asked about this. So you've probably noticed this nice shiny black car uh, that's been sitting in front of the field house. Um, so we are in the process of re- um, in stating our driver's ed program, which we did suspend a few years ago. Um, and so we are currently awaiting a final approval from the Registry of Motor Vehicles. Uh, just so you know where we're at with this, once the Registry of Motor Vehicles approves the program, we will be offering classes after school, on weekends, during school vacation weeks in the summer. Um, the teachers will be certified teachers from the high school who did the program in the past. So they've been certified by the Registry of Motor Vehicles to, to do the program. The fee for the program is going to be $675, which is extremely competitive and less than some of our regional competitors. Um, it's going to include 30 hours of classroom instruction, 12 hours of driving instruction, 6 hours of driving observation, and the mandatory 2-hour parent-guardian class. So we're hoping that this is going to start before school begins, but if not, it will happen shortly after that. So that's where we're at with drivers. Dr. Doherty, will there be a sign-up process through Edline? How will students, do? have we worked through those details yet? It would be probably very similar to what we do for any class. It would be sent out okay. to all parents, and then there would be a sign-up process, yes. Is it typically a semester long? I, I, don't, I don't know how long driver's ed um, lasts. The, the class, if you do, the, well, the, the class part can take as little as a week if you do an intense sure. one-week program during the summer, or it, it, would, it would take maybe up to 10 weeks, okay. depending on, you know, if you do during the school year. Okay. I think this is an, uh, an incredible offering. I'm psyched that we brought it back. I think it's going to make our students' lives a lot easier and our parents' lives a lot easier, so that's great. M Mrs. Webb? Um, so it's only $600 more than 1980. 1980. That's pretty good, I think, actually. <laughs> um, but how, what's the capacity? Uh, how many students will you be able to serve? I, 
I you wouldn't be able yet? to. I don't know the answer to that. I'm not. So, I didn't go okay. that deep into the conversation. No, that's Mrs. great Gallagher. because it's you. It's you. Um, I don't know. It's hard to get it under a thousand dollars at a yeah. at a good quality place where you know you know that the student is actually getting all the hours and that the um, instructors are taking it seriously and documenting it. And so I think it's great. Great, Mrs. Browski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two questions on this one. Um, first, is the anticipation that that $675 tuition will cover the costs of the program? Yes. Okay. And my next question is, is related, if I might. Uh, the accounting of it, does it have its own revolving fund? Will it, uh, where will we see it in the budget? So it's in the adult, it would be in the adult okay. ed revolving account. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just a quick thing. I know from coming from me, I know a lot of students are going to be really excited about Travis, Travis at through school. So one of the reasons I was asking Dr. Doherty is I think the parents are going to be equally as excited because <laughs> it's hard to schedule. Um, it's you know speaking as a, a parent of a young driver, it's it's really an ordeal. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be fantastic. Yeah, Miss Siebert, I'm sorry. Did you have a report this evening? Yes. Let's have at it. Um, Dr. Doherty, were you finished as I interrupt you again? The only other thing I wanted to mention <laughs> is I have an updated enrollment report as of this morning. Um, there hasn't been a lot of major changes. Uh, the trends are still what they were the last time. Uh, the Eaton class sizes are 24, which is very concerning at kindergarten. Um, and so, as I said last time, we will be hiring paraeducators for the morning so that we will have sufficient um, adults in those classrooms. Uh, for those high class sizes. Um, we do, we are getting a lot of calls uh, and there are still a lot of homes for sale, which makes me always nervous that, <laughs> that do we have the, you know, the space. But, um, you know, so this is our latest report as of this morning. Sure. Ms. Borowski? Thank you. Um, can you go through the, the Eaton numbers again? It looks like 58 full days. No, that this is an integrated class. <gasps> Uh, so they're 24s. Thank you. That's if we didn't go integrated there, we would would require more than three classrooms. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Doherty, thank you for clarifying because I think I missed that the last meeting as well as far as the paraeducators go. Obviously, we're going to make sure that in those larger classrooms, there's enough support. Thank you for stating that. So which one is not the integrated? Don't we have one or is only? Eaton and Birch Meadow are integrated. Okay. I should just kind of put a note on that somewhere. I was... Do we have now a, I'm done. Do we have a historical trend? That 2,000 is kind of a nice even number. Is that up? up? Oh. Um, is that up or? Um, you know, I'm not sure. I'll have to look. It, I'll have to uh, look okay. to see. Don't take too much time, but it might be interesting just to see what that number is historically. Yep. Great. Ms. Siebert, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. That's okay. Um, so in your packet tonight is uh, um, another update on the finances. The fiscal year that just uh, completed. We had our last warrant last week. Um, I don't anticipate any other FY14 warrants, um, but certainly while the fiscal year is still up in the town of Houghton, I can, uh, can open one if she'd like. But but I think at this point we're, we're fairly finalized. Um, in the second column on the sheet, you can see where the budget amendments that you approved at the last school committee meeting. I'm uh, mostly up in the top section with the administrative, the health services, the extracurricular. Those budget transfers were processed. And so now you can see on the far right, you can see that all the, um, all the categories are in a, a positive balance, whereas prior they were not. Um, I'm not sure if you have any questions, if you want me to walk you through the whole thing, or? Sure, are there questions from the committee? Oh, oh, it not very much changed from the last right. time, other than I have processed the um, the drawdowns and the revolving funds. Great. Thank you very much for the update. Thanks. So, um, Martha, uh, well, that was our FY14 budget update. Okay, I have to keep my I have to keep careful order here, or else I forget something. Thank you again. Uh, Dr. Doherty, would you like to talk about the school calendar re sure. revisions next? Thank you. Um, and I apologize that this was a late entry to the packet because I 
in the contract we are to consult with the RTA when we're making changes they don't necessarily get to approve the calendar but I was waiting for their um, feedback and I received it this weekend late this weekend so um, that's why you didn't receive this until um, to today so I'm requesting two changes be made um, to the, the and it's just for this school year's calendar that we're talking about 2014-15 one is um, under the new collective bargaining agreement, which was just ratified, um, we can use the 181st school day if, uh, if we want as a professional development day. And given the fact that time is at a premium for our teachers to collaborate and work together on various initiatives that are going on with the district, um, I'm recommending that we do something similar that we did last year, which is to take the 181st student day and make it a professional day which would be on October 14th um, which is the day after Columbus Day um, which would give families an, uh, an extended long weekend um, which I know families in, would like um, so that that's the first um, recommendation the second recommendation is just a movement of a current um, conference day which has been the last few years in uh, December and moving that to November 21st which actually is the date that we used to have it up until about two or three years ago the reason for this change is that we've had a group of elementary teachers and administrators working um, to improve the reporting process for report cards and one of their recommendations and I'm we're going to report out to you at a later date on some of the other changes um, is to move the conference date back earlier um, to give parents, um, you know, an earlier snapshot of, of their child's progress. Um, so these, these two changes I'm recommending. The reason why I'm asking you to do it now is that so schools can start um, publicizing their calendars. We can publicize this calendar now rather than wait until um, August or, or in early in the fall. Can I just? Absolutely, Mr. Vice. <coughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to clarify. So the, that in-service day is for pre-K to 5 and 9 to 12, but. Which day are we talking about? But wait, November? Am I on the right? The November day, the change? Or is that? No, it's, a, it's, it's the whole district. It is? It's a full 12. day. It's the whole district. It's November 21st. OK. The note says pre-K to. 12 and service day. Pre-K. 9 to 12, that misses 6 to 8. On a different date, though, right, Mrs. Am I on the wrong date? No, I'm well, it does say pre-K to 12 in service. It has no school. No school. No school. No, it says, it says pre-K, well, it's pre-K to 5, 9 through 12 is parent conferences that day. Right, what about 6 through 8? That's an in-service day. So there's no, so, right, so there's no parent conferences that for the 6th through 8th grade parents? No, there hasn't, there's never been. Because okay. teams Because the meet, teams are different, they meet, right. They can meet at any time. It's been a little do. while, that's why I yeah. just was, yeah. Okay. Um, okay no, right. No school for the district. Sure, Mrs. Rowe. Go ahead. I just have. I just want to sort of acknowledge. I think that um, the ha choosing to do the professional development to allow families the longer weekend is great. I, I like it there. I also just also want to acknowledge that not all people have that Monday holiday and Tuesday holiday. So, for some people, you know, it is it is something that um, you know they have to get childcare for those two days. But um, I think it's important that we're doing the professional development for the teachers, and you know this does give that uh, light, a nice long weekend for those people that can take it off. I just want to acknowledge that. Other questions from the committee? No, I, I'd also, um, Mrs. Webb, I'd echo that. I might also say we take changes to the calendar pretty serious around here yes. because we do know that parents are planning their lives and their busy schedules. So this isn't something that we. Uh, boy, I can't, uh, I can't remember Dr. Doherty us ever making a change like this late, so I just want to acknowledge that we do take this seriously and we don't uh, make these decisions kind of randomly. Uh, with that said, I was hoping I had a motion. We do have a motion. Awesome. I move to approve the recommended changes to the 2014-15 school calendar. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Is there further discussion around the calendar? I just had a quick, of course. I just wanted to acknowledge, looking at the copy of the calendar, I'm really pleased to see 
the respect and follow through on the accommodation for religious policies with the um, different holidays written into the calendar so that people, teachers and families can be aware of what's going on there with holidays. And I thank you for doing incorporating that. It'll help with the planning. Thank you. Great. Ms. Krawski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I really have a suggestion. I think I know how important it is to have solid professional development, especially in the last couple of years where there's been such tremendous changes in education. Um, but I think giving up a day of student learning is, is a big give up. So my suggestion would be um, perhaps that we could have a presentation in the spring from the superintendent or, or assistant superintendent Martin on professional development. I know there are some significant changes going into effect in the 2014-15 school year, and I'd be really interested in the spring to hear how those have been implemented, um, what the staff's opinion about the changes to professional development is. I am. Um, I think if we're going to make this change, we should sort of follow through on the other side and say, how did that go? And, and was, was there a significant impact to student learning based on this decision? So that's just a suggestion. Duly noted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, motion has been made, seconded. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed. And the motion carries 4-0. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. You're welcome. Okay, why don't we go into uh, new business uh, with the Personnel Facilities Rental Coordinator, Dr. Doherty. Um, so this is, as you see by the memo, um, currently the uh, facilities rental is under community ed. And a year ago, we moved it under community ed. We felt it would be more efficient because a lot of the, um, the programs that happen in community and require the rental, require facility rental. So in order to do that, we made, we made some changes um, to staffing patterns at that time and moved, moved facilities rental under um, community ed. We've had a year to review it and we have analyzed that what has actually happened is now more than one person has to be involved in the rental of facilities, not just the person that is taking the information, uh, whether it be online or by telephone, but also we have someone under facilities that has to become involved because they're the ones that are talking to the vendor um, or the person that's renting the, f the facility, which means then that they are dealing with issues of heating and cooling and um, whether you need microphones and lighting and special equipment and all of those things. Um, you also have situations where the custodian may not uh, be there. And so if the custodian doesn't show up, then someone needs to be contacted. So then we have, if, if it's the use of the Performing Arts Center, um, the Director of Fine Arts has had to get involved several times. Um, so what had happened was something that seemed pretty logical actually turned into something much more complicated. So after some discussions that we've had for several months now, um, what we are proposing, and the reason why we're coming to the school committee is because this is a new position, which does not require any additional funding. Um, and I want to make that very clear. We are not adding any funding as a result uh, of this. We are taking positions that already existed. We're either eliminating them or we're restructuring them and taking those funds to create a position, uh, a point six position, which is called the... Um, Facility, facility rental coordinator position. And so this person would be put back under facilities. Uh, they would report directly to our new director of facilities. Um, and they would be the contact person for any party that's renting the facility. They would be the person that would be talking to our office for billing purposes, which is extremely important. And I'm sure Martha can talk more about that. They're the person that um, would be involved in any additional equipment that would be needed, whether it be for the performing arts centers that we have, either at Parker or the high school, or for the use of the field house. Um, so they will now be the contact person um, for, this, for this position. Uh, so the restructured amount is $29,000, which that's what, how you get the new 0. .6 position. Um, so we're, we're requesting that the school committee approve these changes for this position. Great. Do I have a motion? 
I'd like to move to approve the creation of the facility rental coordinator position as outlined in the superintendent's memorandum. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Discussion? Mrs. Webb. I just want to highlight that I think the, uh, the focus on sort of the, the care of the facilities is, you know, not just limited to these two, like, premier facilities that we have, but to any facilities that are being rented. So whether you're talking about, like, the field house or the wrestling room, you know, we've had some discussions, you know, the, those rooms get rented by a number of groups. So I think it's really important that when you look at it, you know, the, that we're assuring that the groups that are using it are leaving those rooms in at least at least the same condition, um, and specifically the equipment in those rooms, right, as, they, as it was when they started the usage of the facility. So I think that seems like it's one thing that this will do is help to um, ensure that, that focus, as well as it sounds like, you know, really streamline processes that had inadvertently become inefficient. Um, I assume, is the facilities rental, is that through School Dude or some other? School Dude. Okay. Yes. Yeah, which is still pretty slick. Is it still pretty slick? Do they keep upgrading School Dude or is it? Yeah. Yes. All right. I mean, it was a pretty good piece of software six or seven years ago. So okay. It's um, used by a lot of districts as mm -hmm. well. So I do think that they make a lot of modifications and upgrades to it because right. it is used for a lot, of, not just facilities, rentals. It's oh. our work order system. Right. If someone, you know, a door is broken or things like and that. We're that. actually looking at it, too, for our... Uh, technology work order system too. We're taking a look to see if that's a more effective way as well. Oh, that's good. I know we were an early adopter yeah. on school dues, yeah. so that's I'm glad to see that that's you know still the mechanism and that they've uh, continued to enhance that software. So yeah, I support it. I want to see all the facilities <laughs> kept really good track of. Andrew, do you have a question? Um, yeah, I work for the town doing the lighting oh, that's um, right. for um, <laughs> the Performing Arts Center. So this person would be contacting like, people like myself, yes. the custodian. Yes, as part of their role, they would be either they would be training and also uh, contacting, assigning oh, okay. technician techs to do the the lighting and the sound. Okay. Is yeah. this a, I'm just a little confused. Is someone you're going to hire? This is a new position. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mrs. Browski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the community ed program will now have to contact this person just like an outside vendor would. Is that correct? It, when they need, they would sign up for it on school dude. Be, yes. So they, it's so wonderful. So that's just yes. It, like anyone else who needs a room or a facility, they'll go through the same process. Great. So um, yeah, my only comment is inefficiency makes me crazy, and this seems more efficient. Yes. So. <laughs> Can I just? Clarify so, but internally we have people have access to school dues. So the community, yes. but when an outside person calls, um, you know, to rent, the, I don't know, the Thunder Soccer Group or whatever they are, they don't actually go directly into school dude. Is that correct? Do they 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 call? Is that phone and then the person here puts that? It, it's in? a combination of both. They can go online or they can oh, call. If they need okay. more information, they call. If they can go right, they can go right on. Oh, if now not, they just can. so you know, there's there's a period of time. The schools get first priority, and then town uh, recreation would get the next priority at once the school events are filled, um, and then it's open to the to the community or outside com the community. Okay. okay. So and there's there's like dates that have they have to be booked by mm -hmm. at each with each group. Okay. Good. Dr. Doherty, is it fair to say that this might also give that person some time to see if we are utilizing? All of our space as efficiently as we can. When yes, it comes they to will be part of the recruitment effort. Actually, they will be the lead recruiter to attract great more people to use the facility. Even better. Great. Thank you very much. So we're hoping that this will lead into an increase in revenue. The other piece that I put in the memo that I just want to mention, and we will be coming to you with this, um, is that we may be coming to you with a new fee structure for the way we use our, the equipment that we have in, in the building, particularly in the two fine and performing arts centers. Mm -hmm. you know, for example, right now I believe we charge a flat fee for the use of lighting, sound, uh, to have a technician, um, and that we may create like a differentiated fee structure um, as well, which we'll come to the committee for. Great, any further questions? Seeing none, time for a vote. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? The motion carries 4-0. Next on the agenda is the first reading of policy JEC, which is the disciplinary due process policy. 
uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mrs. Snowdoxer if she'll be so kind as to perform that first reading. Before we do that, however, Dr. Doherty, would you like an opportunity to tell us what's been modified? So if we do stop Ms. Doxer mid-flight, we'll know. <laughs> so um, if you look at the original policy JEC, it's one paragraph. Um, this is a much more extensive policy. And the reason for that is the law has changed effective July 1st. Um, and the whole basis of this law, um, although it goes in, th this goes into a lot, um, but the whole basis of the new law, which is 37 H and three quarters, and I can give you a whole history of where that came from, but 37 H and three quarters is to provide educational opportunities for students that have been suspended 10 days or more and, uh, and to provide access to coursework for students that have been suspended 10 days, or less, than, less than 10 days. So we are now required by law for students that's been suspended for 10 consecutive days, we need to provide, or more, to provide um, educational access to the curriculum. Um, it seems like common sense, and this is something that I, I think Reading has been doing, but there's been a lot of school districts that have not been doing this. So students get suspended for many, many days. There's a big gap in their education, and they come back, and there's loss of learning. So. <clears throat> That was the original intent in the law. Is, are there a lot of students in running that this policy would affect? No, but it does give us an opportunity to put in writing the entire disciplinary due process. A lot of this will go into student handbooks. This was written by um, our student legal counsel, um, uh, this policy. So, and very similar language will go into the, uh, the student handbooks uh, at, at all levels. Mrs. Webb. So I just want to make sure I get this straight. So 37 and a half yeah. is <clears throat> as relates to these um, losses of privilege suspensions when the offenses are related to dangerous weapons, drugs, assault. 37 H and 37 and an H, H and a and half, half. Re relate to um, weapons, drugs, assault. Um, yes. Okay. And was that that's not that's been in Massachusetts law those two laws have been in okay, effect for a but, while but and but it wasn't was it stated just as we follow the law and the policy before I didn't look at the previous edition um, of this policy yeah it's, or, it's it's a pretty general paragraph okay so then so then the new the newer piece was the uh, 37 H and three quarters Correct. which relates to these types of disciplinary consequences not related to those other Root causes. Right. Okay. And the due process that goes along with it. With it. Okay. Hang and it, the, our legal counsel felt it was important to capture that in writing as a policy. Normally we don't. But you'll notice that the, the longer policies in your handbook are more uh, are safety and security policies. And right. So that this, this would fall under that. So are you saying that this whole thing, this will be in the student handbook? Yes. A lot of our... A lot of your policies that deal with state safety and security are in student handbooks. I know. It just seems like. Well, well, most people don't print the handbook out. It's online. We're not. We're not. Yeah, we don't need to print the handbook out anymore. So I guess it's doesn't. It, you know, it's um, it's it's quite complex, and there's there's no um, like abstract in the front of it. Uh, but yeah. uh, okay. So I would like to ask. Mrs. Snowdoxer, if she would begin reading, I'd rather spend the time discussing the policy than listening to it. So if someone who wants to make a friendly amendment as she or a, a motion as she starts, that would be okay with me. Okay. This is no I have a question. There are a few typos in here. Yeah. Can we just send those afterwards rather than take our yeah. time now? You can send to those to Linda. Yes, I know there's one town listed that doesn't feel on. Be, yeah. <laughs> right on. I apologize, I didn't catch that. I thought in the title, disciplinary. So it's spelled wrong. Oh my gosh. Disciplinary due process. So just read and. Yes, please. Thank you. The Reading Public Schools shall develop administrative guidelines Chair, addressing I, the yes, disciplinary. Can I make a motion that we uh, refrain from further reading and engage in dialogue sure, on is the there subject a second? matter? Second. All those in favor? Thank you. <laughs> now we can actually continue the discussion. I, I would like to start, however, by saying this is a very lengthy document, and it's a document that 
Uh, parents should read, and if they have questions on, should be getting in touch with the school committee and making sure that those concerns are heard. With that said, I will remind people that um, this is on Edline. It is available for anyone to look at and read. Uh, please send feedback to school committee uh, members. We'll make sure that your voices are heard. There's a, there's a lot that goes into this document. So I, I really do want the community to have an opportunity to uh, reflect on it as well as the committee. Uh, with that, Mrs. Webb. Okay, so one of the things that I thought was important is parent notification. As I started reading through here, I, I was, you know, started looking for making sure that parent notification is, um, you know, w mm -hmm. embedded in the process, and clearly it is throughout the process. Uh, I'm going to guess that's, or I don't want to guess or assume, some of the notifications are, I mean, almost everywhere it's like we'll notify you either by hand or by certified mail or, you know, multiple methods. So um, I guess is it the experience that that's as by law. Okay, so that's a by lot law. of what you're seeing in this is is the law, okay. and is using using the verbiage from the law. So does that mean that you wouldn't notify them by the, our typical method would be probably more electronic, or does it mean that you would be notifying parents electronically and probably using these other methods? I think the first. Notification is certainly by phone. If by we can. oral, yeah, right. it's oral. Okay. So. It's always, and then, you know, then you always should follow up in writing. Right, right. Okay. So I, I think that would be the two. Okay, and there's multiple methods of yes. the follow up in writing to yes. assure that you get the parent. Okay. So it, it does appear to be well <coughs> embedded into the process in terms of parent notification. Did you have a question, Mrs. Landry? I, do, I don't. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Browski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to go off of what you were just saying because a concern that I had was it seems to me that parental notification starts at office detention and forward. So is there no parental notification for loss of privileges or teacher detention? No, there is. There, there is. is. Yep. Okay. Is is it is that just protocol or is it actually? No, any? that's that's protocol. The, the parents okay. always notify when a student oh. is has a consequence. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, Sorry, can I, can I ask a clarifying question? I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't pick up all of that. Students who receive detention after school detention, are parents notified? They, is, um, they should be, yeah. Good. No, because I haven't been notified, so I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming we're okay at the Caruso household. But no news, even, good news. Even, for a, um, even for a detention at the middle school level and the high school level, parents are notified. They Excellent. Should be. No, I'm not questioning it. I, it's, no, it I'm be. just asking yeah. policy. Thank you very much. Further questions, Mrs. Webb. I actually have a question about um, on that page one, the, uh, where Jean was just highlighting um, disciplinary consequences. Students who are found to be under the influence at any school event, I was sort of like under the influence of. Why don't we have to specify what they're under the influence of there? I know it, the further policy talks about um, you know the weapons, drugs, etc. Yep. I just thought that was a little vague for how how. Um, specific this legal policy is, but then maybe I thought I do not know the legal interpretation of under the influence. So does that mean something specific? It means... Well, you... Yeah, yeah, under the influence is, yes, it would be on under any type of substance. So I mean, we could certainly add... I don't know, I would the, just... Like, I, you know, I could check with. Might the, we refer to the list that we've already outlined? Yeah, I mean, in the chemical health yeah. policy, you right. have a yeah. whole other well, policy sure. that. So talks maybe we want to, okay. in parens, see the chemical health policy dash right. blah 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 for the definition yeah, of. That's all. The I influence. just thought we should, because they could be, you know, not under the influence of a hypnotist or something. But you know, I don't know. Just Make sure the minutes reflect that, please. No, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thought for as specific as this document is, we that's should. So I think that's a good tie back to then the chemical health policy, perhaps. Mrs. Doctor. One of the things w that I was looking for as I went through this um, document was the support of the students who are going through this disciplinary process. And I think it's great that we have this policy because basically what it is doing is making sure there is support academically for students. And I asked, um, a question about the support built in when there is a consequence for a poor choice, whether there would be 
the discussion component of it with whoever made that bad choice, the student. So there's a consequence of staying, loss of privileges or staying after school or a detention, but is there also that um, discussion, counseling, intervention piece that goes with that consequence? And um, I, the answer that I got was helpful to me. So I was going, I wanted to ask that question again in terms, and part of the answer was that the policy goes so far, but there are guidelines that go farther. In terms yeah, of I, I mean, yes, this policy is very specific. And my fear is always with policies is that the more you put in, the less leeway administrators have in implementing the policy. But there are definitely things when administrators are doing some sort of discipline, they are sitting down with the student, depending on the level. You know, it's age appropriate talking to them about the consequence and how they could have made a better choice. Um, again, it depends on the consequence because if someone is bringing in a weapon or something like that, I don't think you're sitting there having that kind of conversation. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think, and that's why you need to have flexibility in, in that. But the administrators are, they do have these conversations with kids. Thank you. Dr. Dory, oh, may I? Uh, you sure? Yes. Right. So, I'm sorry. I, um, first time a lot of us have seen the suggestion of a Saturday detention. Uh, yep. is, that, is that in the policy to provide the possibility of yeah, it's, talking it, about Yeah, it gives that? us flexibility in the future. Under the law, we have to provide a list of options for students that have been suspended more than 10 days. So we have been developing a list of possible options. We can't just give them one. We have to give some options. So we are looking at different options. Saturday uh, detention is, is something that has been successful in other school districts. So we want it in there, which gives us the flexibility down the road to use it. I don't think this is something that we're going to start on day one. Okay. But it is something that down the road. So I, thank you. We could be looking at I think that's very important for uh, people that may be listening, that Saturday detention is in this policy, but it's not something we're looking to implement. It's something that we're putting in this policy that we could so that we could have further discussions right. if applicable. Thank you very much. I knew Andrea over there was nervous about that. And it wouldn't sure. just be our quote unquote breakfast club type <laughs> Saturday detention. I wasn't gonna make um, the joke. I wasn't gonna <laughs> uh, There's a lot of programs you can do in a three hour time sure. span on a Saturday that includes restorative justice, it includes academic tutoring. Sure. You know, so there are things you can put in to make the community service. So there are things you can put into those three hours that make it like the student is giving back sure. um, to, the, to the school community. Mrs. Broski had her hand in hand first. Thank you very much. Um, I, uh, one concern I heard from a parent actually had to do around religious observances on Saturdays. Um, is there any way, and I don't know if maybe the lawyer could answer this question, that there could be some caveat put in here that when a consequence is assigned that conflicts with the religious obligation, that parents will be consulted and an alternative will be found? Yeah, we can... And I, I mean, I think we would do that anyway. I would hope so. Yeah, I would we absolutely would do that hope anyway. so. I, yeah, we would do that anyway. Maybe. I mean, we and, and our, I but, think our religious observance policy that the committee passed last year, approved last year, speaks to that. That covers disciplinary. Um, it, well. it covers any any event that happens on a religious holiday. And you know, I, and that's the danger about putting things into policies. With, yep. I. I can't imagine our administrators not respecting someone's, you know, observance of, of religion on a Saturday. I, okay. Mrs. Webb? So it, would, that, would that Saturday, would this be more like a case-by-case -case basis then, like in terms of the use of a Saturday detention? It's, this sounds like it would be more, you know, like a case-by-case -case basis, or w would it be something that it's like, okay, we've got, you know, Three kids. We're going to do this. We're going to get them all together. And we're going to figure out the Saturday attention. I just when I looked I, at this, I, think I thought this was case by case. It's too early in the case. process to even go into detail okay. on Saturday because right. I don't even think it's. We have a new high school principal. Yeah. I am sure that as part of his entry plan, he is going to be looking at data in terms of detentions and you know what mm -hmm. are we using yep. for now and what are the alternatives and I, I 
that's why I, I don't even want to okay. comment on what it could look like. So my, just, my concern at bringing yeah. it up in the first place was to start some groundswell of people yeah. right. talking. And again, this is just in here so that we can discuss it at a future date. It gives flexibility down the road. Thank you. Right. It says time. may be utilized. Yep. <laughs> Um, and not not at the elementary level at all. It's not even right. Elementary, option. right? Yeah, we we had a long conversation with principals, and it, it just didn't seem developmentally appropriate. Mm -hmm. No, this is not okay. I had actually a question on page two of the policy, where it's, I think it's um, related to what you're saying, Dr. Darty, about a policy being very specific. Here it says in the fourth paragraph down, except on Fridays, in terms of. Um, office detention will have is held every day immediately after school at, except on Fridays and I'm wondering why we have to specify that it can't happen on Fridays as opposed to it might be that there's something happening on any one of the days that it would be up to the discretion of um, the administrator yeah, why do we even because okay. if you say it can't happen yeah. on Friday That's a then good point. Yep. Yeah. That. Dr. Doria, a general question. Uh, are we out of compliance right now by not having this policy in place? Well, the law is going to happen whether this policy is passed right. or not. Uh, my question is, and it's going back to your earlier comment about our new principal. Should we be giving our new principal the opportunity to read this? And he's yeah. already read it. Okay. He's already been part of the discussions with the district leadership team, so he's very well aware of it. Okay. And, right. and this yep. law is going to kick in. Actually, it's already kicked in. Right. That's why I was wondering if we were out of compliance because we didn't have this in our handbook. And thinking back again to making sure We will be out of compliance when school starts. Okay. If we don't. Okay. Um, wow, I hate to keep bringing it up. But once Mrs. Doxer pointed that line out, I read the next sentence, which is, Failure to report to or disruption will result in a Saturday detention. So I am concerned that we're yeah. setting more precedent than we're writing for Dr. Doherty. So we can change I, will to May. Okay. Th thank you. I can only imagine, you know, the <laughs> conversations that we'll be having. So um, more, more questions? Again, uh, just uh, for some of the newer committee members, and I'll probably get it wrong myself, this is the first reading. We don't take a vote on this this evening. Uh, we'll take a vote to accept this as our first reading, but that has no uh, binding effect as to whether or not we'll approve the final policy. So there'll absolutely be time for Mr. Robinson to weigh in, uh, for community members to weigh in, and people to think about this. With that said, I was kind of hoping there'd be a motion. To accept the first reading? Okay, I just was. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Skimming yeah. to no, oh, I apologize. Yeah, I kind of cut that out. No, I, you know what? We can absolutely continue the conversation, Mrs. Doctor. I jumped ahead, so we can absolutely continue. Um, I actually had a question later on in the policy. It talks about the principal as being pivotal in discussions um, in the hearing process. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in why it's only the principal. Why aren't there actually the two? That's the way it's stated in the law. Um, so we've often taken the law and then held that as the minimum of what we look towards for our own policies. And in this case, the principal is the, is the um, lead disciplinarian. He's the one that would be making decisions on suspensions, expulsions. No one else has that authority by law. My concern is that if there is a there is a hearing called and there's a question about a he said she said and there's only the principal in the room and the parents and the student that and i understand that a student may call also witnesses mm -hmm. but when i was reading through this i was thinking wouldn't it be helpful to have another administrator not dictating which one there, but, there always is they but again, it's, it's don't want to get don't too need specific. To put that in the policy. I just that's, <laughs> thank you. That makes me feel better. The law is very clear that the principal is the sole, you know, authority in, mm -hmm. for for suspensions, and you know you can't delegate that. Um, just like they can appeal it to this, you notice they can appeal it to the superintendent. Yes. Okay. They can't appeal it to any other central office administrator. Okay. Thank you. 
We'll keep it going here. <laughs> Come on, you guys. I'm all set. That was my repeated note. Oh, there was another. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we do we expect that we're doing the second reading in August? Is that the yes? Yes. You, yes. Otherwise, before before the start of the school year. Yes. Okay. Mrs. Doxer. Um, on page twelve, I realize that this is the law into our uh, into our handbook, but um, it's repeatedly referred to the principal or headmaster. So. And it's indented, so it might be that this is just the quote from the law, but a headmaster doesn't really apply in Reading. Oh, yeah. That's so I didn't know if that should be adapted for we our... Can, we can remove it. It's not going to affect the policy either way, but we can remove it. Okay. Thank you. One for, last question for me, and I'm done. Uh, previously... If a student had been suspended from school, were they given the opportunity to complete academic assignments that they may be missing? In also? writing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now it's absolutely part yeah. of our policy, yeah. just to make sure people are aware of that. Thank you very much. Mrs. Doxer. I'd like to just um, a caveat. I just actually, before I received this, read an article in the Southern Poverty Law Center newsletter. And this law evolved partially because not all schools did allow students to make up their work. And in some cases, it became a weapon of prejudice against some of the students where they were being penalized for small infractions like being tardy and they were getting suspensions. And so this law protects and, and mm -hmm. sort of um, prioritizes and, and protects students against that kind of um, abuse from that. Well, let's just be clear in case somebody came in in the middle of what you just said that that was not in any way um, yes. talking about Reading as Dr. Right. Darty just said that it was students down south. Right, have always been given the opportunity to um, get access to the curriculum material and complete work. Thank you Mrs. Great. Webb. I was absolutely not talking no, about Reading. No but I, I it, it points to why um, we need to take a vote on this and why we would be out of compliance if you know if we don't do that when the school year starts so hi mrs Jackson. hi so in my scribbles i had one more question and um and that is on page 13 it talks about how a school must take a student back after they have served their suspension or um the the consequences and I was where, wondering. I'm sorry, where are you? Sorry, on page 13, the last paragraph, where it so says. So this is this is for special education students we're talking about now. Uh, so no, it was for discipline students with disabilities. Yeah, this oh, is I which is a whole other set of regulations. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. Yes. So on that at the bottom, it says the school must take the student back, and then I was wondering if the school. If there's leeway there for a school to decide that the program being offered to that student isn't answering their needs. I'm sorry, I don't know where you are at. Yes. So um, that would require, it's again, that's a separate set of regulations which involves special education. So that would be a team decision. Okay. But there, it would be the school could decide that the program here is not, not answering the, school, the needs? The team. The team. Yes, the Sorry. IP team. Okay. From the. But the, 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 they always go back to the least restrictive environment. Thank you. You may have a motion. Thank you. I move to uh, I move to accept the first reading of policy JEC disciplinary due process. Excellent. Is there a second? Second. A reminder that this is just the first reading. We'll continue our discussions in August, um, and I look forward to that. Dr. Doherty, thank you. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion. Opposed? Motion carries 4-0. Uh, a quick 
a, a quick break. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Adam uh, Barker, who is joining us this evening. Oh, great. Our new principal at Reading High. It's great to have you. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Uh, you came at a great time as we're reading through policies. So welcome. Uh, maybe we'll have you read the next one. Uh, so thank you again for coming. We hope you're enjoying your summer. We're anxiously looking forward to getting to know you better. Likewise. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so next on the agenda is the second the second first reading, the first reading of policy ADDA background checks. Um, Dr. Doherty, would you like to give an intro before <laughs> sure. we kick this one off? So for, for several years now, all um, employees and volunteers um, uh, get a Corey check every, at least once every, once every three years. Um, one of the things that I don't know if everyone realized about Corey checks is that it only pertains to crimes that were committed in Massachusetts. We are the last state in the nation to pass a law that allows for national background checks, which is the fingerprinting law, um, which is the policy. This, this law was put into place a year ago um, for any new employees coming into the Reading Public Schools. And now we have three years to get all current employees uh, going through the fingerprinting law process. And I did attach the memo that we sent to all employees uh, recently um, on the process that we're going to use for that. So what this policy now refers to is it's expanding the Corey policy that you had and is now changing it to the criminal background check, which includes the, the fingerprinting uh, or what you see is uh, the CHRI portion of the, of the um, policy. The difference between the two from a cost perspective, just so you're aware, is that quarries do not cost any money uh, to either employees or to the school district, whereas the fingerprinting does. Uh, for teachers with, uh, employees with licensure, which includes teachers and administrators, it's a $55 charge. Um, for all other um, employees or volunteers, if we, if we deem that we need to uh, fingerprint volunteers, it's a $35 charge. Um, the other thing about this law right now is that once you do it, you don't need to do it again. So the fingerprinting piece, but the okay. quarries are going to still continue every three years. Uh. Mrs. Webb? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Okay. Does that get you off the hook with the court? Who pays the fee? For who? Yeah. Who pays for the, the fee? For the fingerprinting? Yeah. The, the um, employee or the or volunteer. Or the individual. Yeah. So, we have the, so the volunteers would have to pay the fee if the volunteer is going to be we, unmonitored. It, or, right, yeah, unsupervised and has direct contact. Unsupervised and direct contact. So I may ask uh, the follow the same procedure we followed on the last first reading, which is to ask Ms. Doxer to start reading. <coughs> and if committee members would rather use that time more effectively, we can, we can interrupt. Okay. 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 As part of its ongoing commitment to providing a Mr. safe- Mr. Chairman. Mrs. Webb. I'd like to move Thank that you. we discontinue the reading and engage in discussion is on it, specific is there a second? aspects. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Doherty, I, I guess uh, less of a question and more of a soapbox observation. Yes, I can see the annoyance of asking a parent volunteer to pay money and go through this process, but I also see the safety in that and the responsibility that we have to protect our children, and I don't think that parents are going to be concerned over a one-time payment in a 18-year uh, school career, so I, I kind of I, I I apologize that for that cost, but I'm also grateful for the opportunity to make sure that our kids are safe. So I I don't really have a problem with that. And and I, you know I want to make it and actually I had this conversation with Mrs. Docs earlier today. I, I want to make it clear that you know I would see the the type of volunteer that would we would have to do the fingerprinting would be if chaperoning an overnight field trip or. Um, such as a nature's classroom trip, where they, they very well could have unmonitored direct contact um, with, with students. Um, you know, it would be things like that. Reading 
in front of a class as a mystery reader would not qualify um, as having to have the fingerprinting. Right. So, I, you know, those those are those are things that we're going to have to. Who might me? Who would make that determination? That would be an administrative decision. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Webb, do you have a question? So I, I think one of the most important aspects of this as we started the quarry, and that was I don't know how many years ago, is I think um, beyond, I, I, I would agree that parents really want to keep the kids safe. So if it costs $35 and you have to do your fingerprints, probably parents are going to say that's what we need to do to keep our kids safe. The other piece of it is keeping your pri our private information. It was very, very uncomfortable to be writing down your social security and your driver's license on a piece of paper. So I see it's very, this policy is very detailed now in terms of how that information is kept, who has access right. to it, what happens to it, where it's stored. I mean, so that's, I think, one of the important things is that people and parents need to feel comfortable that they're, you're giving up, like, your really important private information, and um, it, we need to be assured, and we need to assure parents that it's being kept. Yeah, just uh, it, everything is processed through this office. There are none of the buildings have would have access, nor do they now for quarries. Right. All of it's done up here in our central office. Right. And it's one it's one administrator, it's one administrative assistant that does all of all of it. So, and only if there is an issue is it brought to my attention. So, are the quarry forms? Do parents come bring the quarry forms right here? Is that how when you do a quarry? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. That, when we first started this, it yeah, was no, like it was, distributed. I, no, I remember this, many years right. ago. It was different. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that it's important because that's also included in the policy. Right. Those assurances, and um, I, I know I feel strongly about that. This is Doctor. I'd like to suggest too that um, even though volunteers might like to be very willing to invest in having this done, there might be some for whom this is a hardship. And if there were a way for us to have a kitty or a resource that, depending on need, that fee might be able to be paid for someone that cannot do it themselves, so that we're not excluding people from those overnight visits because they can't afford this check. I know it's small. Um, it, it, it yeah, I, I'm. I'm not disagreeing with you. It does create other concerns because then other people are going to ask the question, "Why aren't you paying for me?" I, I just think you're opening up a can of worms that I don't know is something that we can address. And where would that funding come from? Can I just, can I just say uh, one approach? You know, we could take the approach here that this policy gets implemented and we look to the principals and administrators for our feedback. Most of the principals have always, um, maybe the high school less so than our elementary and middle schools, but it's always sort of, you know, the principals, if, if, the, if ever there's an issue with something, come see me, come talk to me. And I think what we would get is we would, we would get the feedback from the principals if it is an issue. So I would imagine that, you know, if a parent um, truly couldn't do that, they would probably see the principal because that is the kind of open door that I think the principals have, and we would know. So I'm just saying, I, I understand. And I'm just, my only concern is where the funding source would I'm not, be. I, I'm not saying to do the funding. I'm saying we would get the feedback. So if sure. we implement this policy, we could we could check in with the principals at the end of the school year, or you could, you know, check in and just say it. Have you know? Is there an issue? And and but again, even if there is, you'd have to put in. You know, you don't want to put in an, a a structure like we do for the uh, was it the athletics. No, which is it? Which has the need based thing? That all of those fees do now actually. Right. So I don't think that for this thirty-five dollar fee, you want to put in a structure like that. That is way, way, way too costly in terms of. The, but that's a structure that fairly evaluates need. But I don't think so this policy that. doesn't talk about the cost no and it doesn't talk about who's going to be paying for it so it's not really part of our discussion this evening with that said though when we do discuss it I I, I res very very respectfully disagree I think we do have a process in place for families with financial hardships to be able to approach the administration very uh, discreetly say I can't afford the $35 or, or whatever that amount is and, and I do think that there'll be few in number and we should be making sure that everybody has 
access to these types of opportunities. But again, it, ref respectfully, maybe we want to hold off on that until we get a better sense from the community of is it a hardship? Right. That's so, sort so of I what I'm suggesting. With both of you, yeah, that's what I suggest. We'll all I'm saying is that this is beyond a hardship question because once you start funding for anyone, there will be other groups that will be saying, "Why aren't you funding this for me?" Right. Sure. Again, so, right. yeah, I, I think I agree. I agree with both points made by the committee members. We should absolutely be respectful and responsive to that need, and we should absolutely see how it's going through principles before we before we act. Would a okay. no, absolutely. Would a principal have the discretion to find? I don't want to say find money, but figure no. out how to. No, no, and that's and I I, I really. Know if this is something we should okay. pursue at this point. I think it was a good question. It was an, it was an excellent question, and we will we'll continue it. Mrs. Brosky. I have a different question. <laughs> um, Dr. Doherty, it said in the policy that fingerprints are not required for volunteers, subcontractors, or laborers, but we can at our discretion. So I assume that would be this office at your discretion. Yes. And the example you gave was mystery reader, no, overnight field trip, yes. yes. Uh, do you envision having a policy that lays out kind of that, or is it really a case by case? I, I think you're talking about for um, ben, ben for fingerprinting. Who needs fingerprinting? Yeah, so it I listed who definitely needs it, and then there's a, a bunch right. of categories. I believe it's volunteers, subcontractors, or laborers that it is not required by law, but the district may require it. Yes, and you know we we'll, we pretty much will follow the Corey direction that we've been taking. Any chance that there would be contact with kids that they're going to go through this unmonitored. Okay. Unmonitored, yeah. Okay, for the volunteers. I guess. No, I'm well. I was more focused now about vendors and laborers and subcontractors oh, 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 and laborers. Okay. if we have someone working on the roof yep right they definitely there's a not, there's a chance okay. that they could have contact with kids who are out on recess and you know we would require that of the vendor right right okay i'm sorry i was thinking of the volunteers mrs browski thank you thank you for that I, I appreciate that your inclination is to be more conservative at that right. i think that's very wise um small question coaches are definitely included it didn't specifically say assistant coaches but i assume assistant. yes coaches okay. yeah, assistant coaches people. any coach okay advisors any anybody that works with kids great. thank you very much great questions again this is only the first reading uh, this will be on headline for the public to read and give feedback to and we can talk about it again at our august meeting do I have a motion? You do have a motion. Move, I move to accept the first reading of the revised policy ADDA background checks. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? The motion carries 4-0. That was great. So we have, thankfully, a long series of donations. And I'm, yeah. I'm hoping for my, my helper. I move to accept the donation in the amount of $1,000 from the Friends of Reading Track to be used to support a coaching assistant position. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion? Other than our thanks? All those in favor? Great. Motion carries 4-0. I move to accept a donation in the amount of $400 from the Young Women's League of Reading to be used to support the students of the Parker Middle School. Is there a second? Second. Great. Discussion? All those in favor? The motion carries 4-0. For the Parker Music Programs, move to accept several donations to be used to support the Parker Middle School Instrumental Music Program. Is there a second? Second. Dr. Doherty, Slightly generic. Do you know if if it was instruments? Was it uh, money? I I, or a combination of both. I believe it was instruments. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Point out. Excellent. Thank you. Is uh, any further discussion besides my silly question? No. Seeing none. All those in favor? Great. Motion carries four zero. I move to accept the donation in the amount of two thousand dollars from Reading Summer Field Hockey to be used to support a coaching assistant position for the 2014 season. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Motion carries 4-0. I move to accept the donation of two field hockey cages from Girl Scout Troops 75403 and 71290. Is there a second? I, I, will, I will mention that that's a great gift. 
can't. And, and it's, all, it's not often that I recall the Girl Scouts yeah, no, earning money like that, and I think that's fantastic. Yep. Thank you. Mrs. Webb. Uh, and I just want to say their letter talking about why this was important to them was really great. And so I think that, I, I mean, I know we send thank yous out to, to everyone, but I really thought their letter was great in terms of really focusing on how important this intramural program was and sort of the rebirth of that and how that connects with sort of the Girl Scout values and, and um, you know, what they're trying to do to do good in the world. So. It was a refreshing piece of reading today, actually. <laughs> Great. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 4-0. We have some minutes to approve. So I move to approve the open session minutes dated June 19th, 2014. Second. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor? Motion carries 4-0. Mrs. Doxer. Move to approve the open session minutes dated June 23rd, 2014. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, those in favor? Opposed? I we, voted. Oh, in yeah, favor. Get, yeah, that's hand up there. <laughs> four nothing. There's only four of us. We need you. <laughs> I move to approve the open session minutes dated June 30th, 2014. Is there a second? Second. Great. All those in favor? I oh, I'm sorry. No, no. We're not voting yet. I apologize. Oh. Mrs. Doxer. I just wanted to say thank you to Mrs. Engelson because the minutes, there's a lot of discussion that goes on in the meetings, and I think that a very succinct and helpful job is done on the minutes. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. All those in favor of the motion and the thanks? Motion carries 4-0. Uh, we do need to go into executive session, however, before that. Dr. Doherty. Um, I just wanted to... Oh, I had to something to say, too, but thank you. Okay. Um, given the fact that you don't have your full committee here, you may not want to go into full into executive session this evening. Well, I'm all for that. Um, so, it, it, which, given the topics, it's fine. It can wait until the August meeting. Uh, how is the committee okay with waiting? I, that's I, important. I would never check my phone during a meeting, but I do know that Mr. Robinson is trying his best to get back. <laughs> no, no, I, I know, but okay. I... Nope, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm okay with if I make a if the administration to, can wait. No, we're, we're fine. Okay. We're fine. We don't even have to make a motion. Oh, we, we, we just don't have to. Okay. Executive okay. Session. But, what, what? Can I go first? Yeah. I was remiss when we were giving reports. The uh, naming subcommittee met earlier today. Uh, my report is very brief. We continue our discussions around uh, both the process and the applications received this, uh, this time around. Our next meeting is scheduled for September 18th, at which point, I said that correctly. August. Uh, we're coming up with a date. It's going to be the week of August 18th. Excuse me, Dr. Doherty. Yes. The week of August 18th? Yeah, it's um, we're going to come up with a date. I apologize. During the meeting, I thought I had heard September. So great. We are going to be meeting the week of August 18th to reconvene, and then we will have a report back to the school committee. Thank you. Um, I was asked, and I will be contacting those applicants to make sure that, uh, that I apologize for the delay and keep them up to date. That was my report on the naming subcommittee. Mrs. Doxer. I do actually, you reminded me, a report on a committee. I'm a liaison to the Human Relations Advisory Council. And we will be having a meeting later in August. Um, we had a report of a problem, and we will be um, reporting out to the community on ways to what to do when people see something, um, uh, see hate in the community, what a process to use to make sure that it's reported and acknowledged. Mrs. Webb, you had your hand up earlier. I, I just wanted to highlight our net so that we, um, we have school committee interviews on the 30th and a financial forum on the 30th, and then our next school committee meeting is August 25th. So I just wanted to verify I was looking at the calendar. and That is correct. So just wanted to make sure this is, this is an up-to-date calendar for the coming year as up-to-date as it can be, as of today. Yes. Okay. Need to incorporate all those dates. And we, I think we've been sending out Outlook invitations, right? Yeah, that's good. So you should. I like that. Yeah. That way you don't have to try to plug them in. Yes. So. Okay. Awesome. I forget. Um, all right, so I'm going to move 
Just ask someone to help me move. Move to, to adjourn. Oh, great. <laughs> Second. Second it. All those in favor? Meeting is adjourned.